opportunity to begin this conversation and to hear the history of racism in our country and, and racism in the church. But one of my loving critiques is that in light of what we heard this morning, we could think that racism was more a part of the past than of the present. And we've, we've touched upon in bits and pieces about the complex nature of systemic racism and the many ways that it manifests both in individual lives and in the lives of our communities. And I think that in order to find healing, it's important to press into some of those things, even as Paulia was saying, into that shared wounds. Because we can, we can pray about it, we can even talk about it on a certain level, but if that talk is without an understanding of the complex system that we're navigating, our actions might not be informed as well as they could be by the reality that we're a part of. So how do we pray and seek the Lord and break the spiritual strongholds, but then take action that is appropriate for the general and specific context that we're a part of? And I think that um, a first step uh, especially as I'll speak for my white brothers and sisters, or as a white person, um, comes to for, for learning, for self-reflection, for realizing that we are actually, I believe, more a part of the problem than we might realize. Not because we intend to be racist or you know do things with ill intent, but because through um, the prejudice that we have and the ways that we've been shaped and socialized as white people through our media, through implicit bias, through... Uh, again, having good intent, but a different kind of impact, it's, you know, we need to be aware of the way that the sin of racism, that the idol of whiteness has shaped us in profound ways that, uh, that create blind spots in our lives, that um, can make it so even the posture that we're coming to these conversations with can be well-intentioned but not helpful. And so I think it's important to take time to humble ourselves, to listen, to learn, uh, even taking in certainly the voices of people of color, but even having white people do some of that self-work before we engage more fully in the conversation. Uh, so again, it can be informed, so it can be humble. And so we take a position in action taking that is uh, following the lead of people of color and learning from our brothers and sisters who uh, will be, have experiences and perspective that will be better suited in this uh, in this situation to take take leadership. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Latanya now because she's going to facilitate a segment. Before I do, I have an announcement. Uh, there's some vehicles parked over by the kitchen and the entry where they've got to move trucks in and out by the dumpster over by Hibbert Hall. So if that's a car or truck that you've parked there, just please, if you could move it. And that's uh, from Julia, who we would love to honor and uh, make sure we can help. So mm -hmm. thank you. Latanya. OK. Um, uh, thank you. I, I wanted to, um, uh, a couple of things. One is um, um, <clears throat> the whole idea, the, the issue of identity. Yeah. So the, the, the challenge that we have is that um, the church is evolving right now, right? There's, there's, a, a, and so the, we, we don't even fully grasp. We're not even fully walking out the fullness of our identity as a church community, right? Sure. So we have a, a, the society is broken, right? Um, there's a broken society, um, but there's a, there's a hindrance from truly understanding who we are as the body of Christ upon the earth. Okay, so there's a, a stunted growth in that, and that has to be um, 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 fixed, and I know that there's steps, and we're doing that, you know, gradually moving in that, but we have to on it, we have to accept that, right, and, and, and acknowledge that, because if we come at it from a different place, we don't, um, we have the, there's the potential of repeating what happened in the past, okay, because I believe the Holy Spirit is leading us to a place of truly coming into our governmental authority as the ecclesia, okay, that's where we are, right? We don't, half of us don't even know what that is. You know, it's like, what the governmental authority of the ecclesia? I mean, what is the ecclesia anyway, you know? 
Right, right, it's an artichoke, right? <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 what does that mean, right? And that's when we need the, the apostolic fathers and mothers and people to speak and define and pull, start pulling us into understanding who we truly are, right? Because once we come into the fullness of that, then we're able to speak in a different way. Okay, so I just want to put that out there in light of how we're wrestling with this situation be, because, um, and we should address it, right? So I just want to say that, and I'm not saying we can't address it until we fix that, you know, one or the other, but we have to make sure we weigh both of them. We understand the tension. And the other piece I wanted to bring up, we started to go somewhere and I, and I felt something. Mm. Um, Bill, before he left, he made a, a comment, and I want to get a reaction to this. Now, and, I, and I want to say this. Um, before we go into, before I ask this question, okay? And that is, is um, sometimes as a, as a people, it's easy to get caught in, um, stay in the place of turbulence, all right? Y you know, because it's familiar, we can kind of stay there. But we, it's important for us to take the plane to 35,000 feet, okay? Um, and to kind of see from that perspective. God's and perspective. To, and to ask questions so that we can go from God's perspective and, and sort of see. So Bill made a, a, a comment, and I wanted to get responses from that because it is a real place, okay? And I want to hear some of the responses. I heard the silence, the dead silence when he said it, you know, <laughs> all right? So I felt that it was something. So he made a statement and said um, that we are not... First, he made a statement saying, you got a head start and that wasn't fair, right? That was a hard, that was coming from a place of hurt. But then he said the truth of, it's not a level playing field. It's not a level playing field. So I want to ha have some of the reactions to just that phrase. It's not a level playing field. And I, I don't want to, um, and, and particularly pe people who are white, I want to hear it's not a level playing field. What does that sound like to you? And be honest about it. That, the honesty is where we want to go. Okay? All right? Redeemed by the gospel. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I so appreciate what um, Bill shared and um, how honest he was and transparent. And uh, so being a mother of, of two adult biracial um, sons, I, um, I could feel his heart. And um, my husband and I, we've been married for 30 years. And I'm one of those people <laughs> who until this past year completely believed that I did not see color. And um, it was through a forum just like this one mm. that uh, my husband and I recently started hosting at our church roundtable discussions on racial reconciliation with a group of people of about half this size, um, that I began to understand that um, it's not a level playing field. And I always thought it, I thought it was in terms of my, um, you know, my perspective. I believed that all men were created equal, and we are, um, by God. But I didn't understand how much... Um, white privilege played into um, society, the roles that we, we play and um, the, way, the way we live. And so for me, I felt that it was, I always thought that I never saw color. And so when Bill said, well, if you don't see, if you say you don't see color, then you don't see me. And that is so true. Um, because I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to see all people. And when we talk about um, repentance beginning with us, it does begin with me. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of areas such as this one example that, that I personally need to repent of. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to uh, hear a little more from, uh, uh, from white people first. But the, 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 I want to say something about the whole notion of, pri of privilege, okay? So privilege, so when, when she said white privilege, for some people you probably had felt something rise up in you, right? You're like, privilege, what are you? Right. Privilege. So... Um, <laughs> So someone gave a, an example of how to see that, and I thought it was really cool, this minister. He said the, the way to look at it, right, is to sort of um, see that, okay, so, you, so say there is a world where everyone, you know, everyone have, you know, they're walking around with two arms, right? But there are also people with one arms. You know? 
if the majority is walking around with two arms, right, it's easy to like not know what it feels like to have one arm. Okay, it's easy to not know what, I mean you don't even have to think about it because you got two arms. You know? mm. yeah, everything you do is kind of a two arm type of thing. But the people with one arms, they are very aware because society is structured, how you open the door, how you sit down, how you do certain things, it's structured for two-armed people. Right? But if, you, if you're in the category of one arm, well, you are reminded every single day that you have one arm. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're reminded every day that you have one arm. And so that, it's a, it's a more tangible thing to kind of see it, right? Um, because if you don't think about it, I get up in the morning, I open the door, I wash with both of my hands, I do certain things in the shower. But if you only have one arm, well, some things will be a little difficult to do. Okay? So I just want to sort of say that. But I want to hear from, for, for, from some other, and a couple other um, uh, white people in response to the comment that Bill made. Um, I know people may feel uncomfortable, but this is, this is, where, this is how you go deep yeah. in the in the conversation, okay? Yeah. Well, my first reaction was compassion, you know, and hearing his heart in it and the pain in it. Uh, he talked about identity, and obviously that is a big part of this topic. And a friend of mine who's here recently went to Rwanda, and there was, as probably all of you know, the genocide in 1994 between the Tutsu and the Hutu. And um, if you think of kind of we're all a part of this fabric of humanity, picturing like a blanket, um, what the colonizers did is they almost put this big rock in the middle of the blanket, creating a tear, you know, in, in creating a false distinction between these people. And they had identification cards and there was... You know, initially the colonizers elevated the Tutsu, um, the Tutsi, and then, um, and then they eventually got to the Hutu and they were like, well, look at the way they're, you know, oppressing you. And then they created this divide mm. between them that was like this false divide. I mean, really, they would say that it was really hard to tell the difference between the two and you couldn't always tell. Mm. And... And so I think sometimes when we're talking about this from um, this issue that we can almost, there's this fallacy of seeing ourselves uh, as separate from the other. Mm -hmm. You know, like Christ doesn't see his body as like, oh, my head's over there and my hand's over there and my legs, you know, you know, lopped off over there. It's like it's one body. And I was personally reflecting recently because I, just in the past, just dissatisfaction with my own body, you know, and, the, and I just had to like repent of, you know, like contempt for my own body in certain ways. And, and then I realized like, wow, we do that in the body of Christ. Like there's that self-contempt amongst ourselves towards one another, like, oh, you believe this or you're this way or whatever. And it's like, no, we're one body. You know, and sometimes we put this weight on things, on differences that are actually, you know, by putting that rock in the middle of the blanket, creating a tear, and then we're trying to hold something, and then those people that are like, I'm going to stand in the gap, and I'm going to be someone reconciling, you know, everyone to one another, and it's like, then you're trying to hold the blanket tear together, you know, and it's like, well, it didn't need to, you didn't need to put the weight of that issue in the blanket to create the tear in the first place. Mm -hmm. And and so I think sometimes, you know, we see, we don't see each other as, when, like you are me, not in a pantheistic way, but we are part of the same body. Now, he had mentioned the uniqueness, so the hand is different than the foot, but it's one body and not to see ourselves as other. So that was kind of the reaction that I had, that it's, Yes, uniqueness, but we're not as other as we think. And if we put too much weight on that, mm -hmm. we're actually creating the tear in the first place mm -hmm. by doing that. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I mean, sense. The, the, the importance of realizing as a body coming together, and we're going to talk about that tonight, but our allegiance first is to Jesus and to his kingdom, yes. right? 
When we, we, when we come from the position, our posture is to our allegiance to Jesus and to the kingdom, well then, that me being a black woman, and I love being a black woman, right? But that's not going to, I'm not going to look at you from the lens of being a black woman. I'm going to look at you at, from the lens of being a woman um, of, uh, uh, who loves Jesus and submitted to and, and, and put all of my sins and my faults at the cross. Mm. All right. And so if, if I'm approaching my, the issues that way, then, then, um, uh, then it takes us to another, then we're able to deal with the other things, right? Mm. It, 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 um, uh, not desensitize it, but it, 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 it takes away a, a little bit of the sting. Yes. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, you can. I concur 100%. I just wanted to say that I think sometimes um, before you can come to the place where you identify with who you are in Christ, it's what we were talking about earlier, dealing with those issues that are there on the inside of you mm -hmm. and God uprooting. Mm -hmm. I know I shared um, in uh, our meeting, I shared a, a specific story for my own self. I couldn't see beyond my pain. You understand? The mm -hmm. pain was there. And until God dealt with the pain, mm -hmm. I wasn't even able to see myself through the light of the gospel. Sharice, mm -hmm. go ahead and if you're willing, share mm -hmm. a little bit of the story. What caused the pain? What I shared um, that particular day, I was in Dallas. I didn't know that I had issues with whites, white people, specifically white women. Mm -hmm. I was in a ministry and I was in leadership. And the pastor and I got along perfectly fine, but his wife and I, for whatever reason, and I went to the Lord and said to the Lord, Lord, why am I responding to her this way? Because if it was anybody else, I would just respond in love. That's what I asked the Lord. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting the response that I got. And when he began to show me, and I'm getting emotional about it, but when he began to show me that over my life, there were people that I had been in relationship with that had wounded me. Mm. He took me all the way back and I had forgotten. Let me tell you how powerful this was for me because I literally had forgotten this young girl. I was in the third grade, the third grade. I'm a 30 something year old woman and I had not dealt with the pain mm. of what a young girl had done to me in the third grade. I was on the bus, I was in Hartford. It was after a traumatic event had happened in my life and we had to move from the inner city to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And I, used, I was the only black girl on that bus. Mm -hmm. And she used to bully me on the bus. Mm -hmm. She would pick at me and pick at me and pick at me and pick at me until one day I punched her in the face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had hurt and anger in my heart towards this little girl in third grade so now here I am in church in ministry and can't walk in love and forgiveness to a white sister because mm -hmm. I was angry at that little girl mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I had to deal with that mm -hmm. I had to deal with that and she wasn't the only one there were two or three other women that the Lord showed me in prayer and I was when he told me I was like oh my gosh because the Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. And if you don't ask him and acknowledge that this may possibly be in your heart, if you can't so be in love with him, that you can go to him and say, Lord, everything in me that's not like you, show it to me. Because mm -hmm. I want it out. I want to be used mm -hmm. the way that I'm supposed to. And I can't be used if I have all of this stuff on the inside of mm -hmm. me. And I can't even see myself in light of the gospel. Mm -hmm. I can't. I can read it. I can read it. I can memorize it. I can do all of that. But until I've uprooted the pain and actually I had to forgive. Mm -hmm. I was on my knees and I'm crying out to the Lord. And I said, Father, I forgive her. Mm -hmm. I release her. Mm -hmm. It was in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That moment shifted my life. And now... My life is full. Amen. You understand? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Maybe I could share a story briefly uh, regarding the unlevel playing field. And I've always perceived it 
especially growing up uh, predominantly wealthy, white uh, neighborhood, Concord, Massachusetts. Um, I always perceived it as, uh, well, I'm not, is it, uh, is, it's like, it, it, was, it was an intellectual understanding of what this uneven playing field would be. Because to me, it was just like growing up, you know, you did what you did and things were the way they were. But when we were going through this process of preparing for what the Lord wants to do the, it, it, he, here even at this event, and Latanya and I and others of you on the panel and I have been working together, uh, processing everything, and what is the Lord after? What is he trying to do in this church? I had this experience, and I was driving in my truck in a town in East Ham, Massachusetts, which is the Cape Cod out on the forearm. It's very remote, also predominantly a white town. And I had grown up there, and it's very not diverse. And the experience that I had was literally the Lord, the Holy Spirit came over me when I was in my truck going about my usual routine, which was to go to the hardware store the, or the donut shop or get a coffee or whatever it was in this little area. And as I'm in my truck, all of a sudden, I felt as though I were a black man sitting in my pickup truck and could perceive, it was like the Holy Spirit just gave me this perspective, I could perceive how it was to be black in this community. And I started seeing how people looked at me. I started sensing even spiritual things, like dynamics of <clears throat> things that were swirling around me as people were interacting. I had never seen this before. I had never understood that at all. You know, it just was like, you know, normally you, in a town like that, you just, hey, Bob, hey, Bill, regular day, everything's normal. Well, when I was there in that truck, in my truck, as a black man, I got the perspective by the spirit of what it was like, of how people would interact with me. And that was totally different. And it kind of shocked me and surprised me. And I felt like the Lord was showing me this as a way of gaining understanding that wasn't theoretical or intellectual, it was actual and it was practical. And uh, so it, it kind of like shocked me and showed me something and I'm like, wow, I really need to adjust my perspective to realize that these things are very real and it happens all the time. Now anyone here who's of color would know that, but how would I know that? Only if God revealed it to me. And so in reflecting on this very thing, you know, I say we, we do have inequality. There are prejudice. There are way people interact. And there are demonic spirits that swirl around that. And so the Lord wants that to be eradicated in the construct of what Martin Luther King was describing of the beloved community which I think is nothing more than the kingdom of God realized. Mm -hmm. So that isn't how it is like in heaven. That isn't how it's supposed to be like in the millennium. That isn't the way it's supposed to be. That's a, if you want to say it, that's an une unlevel playing field. So how do we address it? How do we as the church address it? I, for one, don't believe the way we address it is we bring others down to make us equal. I think it's the other way around. I think it's what can we do to help everyone come up higher to the place where God wants to bring us? In the analogy of Latanya's one arm, two arm, we don't want to have a, you know, a governmental mandate that requires we all amputate one arm. That doesn't make any sense, right? Or we must hurt each other or you know, do something to bring ourselves lower. It's like, no. We need to pray to the Lord of the harvest to be able to bring the healing so that, you know, by the way, God can create a new arm. That's right. There are, heaven, there are creative miracles. So these are not irreparable damages. And even where we don't have a new arm maybe formed, what do we do? We help somebody. We give them a, a prosthetic arm. We give them assistance. We, we don't view it as someone else's problem. We view it as the family's issue because we're family. So I just wanted to put that out there as like, 
there is an uneven playing field even today for sure. And what is the Lord saying? What is his wisdom for how do we bring our, all of ourselves up higher as the community? And I don't know if anyone else wants to share based on that. Please. This is my question. I probably should be in the audience because I have good questions. <laughs> um, my biggest question is why do we as the church identify so closely with what's going on in the world? It's mm. a great question. And can we... Does someone from the audience want to answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> so... So before, before we have a comment, can we just put this into a construct? Because I want to take your question and put it into a construct, which I think is a great question. Uh, and Greg, before you say that, can, yeah. so if, 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 if anyone out there have any questions or comments that you want to add, please come to the microphone up here. Thank we you. want to get that started, okay? So, um, so we're going to move into Q&A. So please you know, start waking, making your way to the microphone. Okay. Yeah, Sharice, you're bringing up this excellent question of uh, why is it that we, why is it that we uh, identify after things of this world or leaders in this world or movements in this world so quickly instead of just being the body of Christ? Is that a fair way of describing what you're saying or no? <clears throat> the microphone back. This young man, he needs to speak. He's been trying since the last session. Wonderful. So at some point, let's get the mic to him. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, Joel. I, I think it is, it, it, it is what I'm saying. But to kind of open it up a little bit. Please. What's going on in the world? Just popped in my mind. We're in the world, but we're not of it. That's the script. We're in the world, but we're not of it. Mm. Yet, we that are in the church identify so closely with what's going on in the world. Mm. And I think it goes back to something Josiah was talking about earlier. Mm. We have to have a biblical mindset and a biblical perspective about everything. Whether it's identity, whether it's family, whether it's government, whether it's our educational system, the Bible, the word of God is our blueprint. Amen. So we're having this, this discussion. It feels like from the, not the perspective of what's in the word of God, but from what's going on in the world. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? And, and our position is just popped in my mind. The earth is the Lord's yeah. and the fullness thereof, Amen. the world and they that dwell therein. <clears throat> so if the earth belongs to my father, who is a king, and I'm a part of his kingdom. I understand that even though I'm living in this world, even though I'm, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing all these things in the world, I'm a part of another kingdom and I'm a part of another system. Amen. So the way that I think, the way that I speak, the way that I move, the way that I build relationships is completely different than what's going on in the world. And the basis of that is heavenly. Joel? Here we go, Joel. So I think you, you kind of just answered your own question. Like there is that, that conflict of understanding of our identity as heirs. Um, and there, there's this, this combination of, okay, like, like it, there, there's been this whole, this whole wave um, like within, within faith of like, oh, I'm a Christian. So like, mm, like nope, mm, I'm Christian, no. Um, but really that identity like being citizens of the kingdom of heaven is like we are to like like represent ourselves and represent that kingdom as we interact with others. Um, so like when I when I wake up in the morning, like I don't think like I'm a black man. Like when I wake up in the morning, like I'm a beloved adopted son of God, and like I'm so yeah. lucky yeah. and like so blessed and like so full of grace to have been you, adopted as an heir. And so when, when, I, when I drive down the street and I feel um, an anxiety or a tension driving past like a police officer, because I know that like one of my brake lights is out and I know that like something mm. could happen, my thought isn't like, oh, my blackness is about to trigger somebody's like ignorance. It's, oh, like this person like might not know that like 
like who I am or like this person might not know who my dad is like this person like might not know this thing about me um, and so like we, we, we tend to um, identify ourselves with what God has graced us to have an understanding of so like I have an understanding of what it is to you know grow up uh, with um, with divorced parents. I have an understanding of what it is to grow up in Manchester, Connecticut. I have an understanding of what it is to have been born in a state that like I only get to visit sometimes. Like I have all these different understandings um, that help me to relate to others, help me to connect to others. Just like when the apostle went in and um, he saw that the people had a shrine to a God that they did not know. Um, he didn't come in and say like, oh, like, I need to, to worship this unknown God too. He was like, oh, like, I know what it is to, like, not have an understanding of the God that, like, serves, like, takes care of me and loves me. Like, let me use this thing that, like, I have an understanding of to, like, help bring you into this kingdom. Um, and, like, that's a big part of what this is, is, like, we're asking these questions of, like, how, how does the world get fixed? Um, <laughs> but, like, it's not like how does the world get fixed? Like it's, it's how how do we represent the kingdom when when we go out? Um, we have you know even that 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 notion of the gap in the cornerstone. Um, there is this whole the notion of the cornerstone is, is you would build up from both sides on top of temporary like wooden structures. You would use stone, build up on both sides, and then there would be this cornerstone that actually took on the pressure and the tension of those stones coming together. That way they could still stand as one stone structure even though they weren't made of one stone. And so, and what that is, is we have these temporary structures. We have churches, like we have like governments, we have all of these very temporary structures. Like compared to the eternity of the, the life that we've been like blessed with, we have these temporary structures that make a, a, a temporary space so that people can decide to grow towards um, the, the cornerstone. Mm. And, you know, and then that creates that picture of, you know, every, there were people of every tribe and every nation and they were all worshiping God. They weren't all looking around being like, whoa, like you're Jamaican, like, whoa, you're Korean. Like, I had no idea that like you could love Jesus. Like, I did not know that, this is weird. They were all just like, paying attention to God. And so yeah. it's like, all right, so what do we do? We set up temporary structures. We like provide the opportunity for people to build upon one another and be like in, intentionally like earnestly seeking God, earnestly seeking Christ. We build these temporary structures and like when people come to Christ, when people come to that, that, that tension, when they come to leaning on Christ, like we move the structure to the next place so that it can happen again. Mm. And yeah. All right. Uh, could we take a question maybe from mm -hmm. the audience? This is and not really a question, but I've had a lot of thoughts mulling in my heart. Um, I do believe that it is right, Joel, that our identity has to be rooted in Christ. I think what we heard this morning is that there's been very mixed messages, even from the church. Mm -hmm. Interpretations of the word of God that left people very wounded. Yeah. And we all need healing. Yes. Um, I have to uh, say that I believe that as a white woman, I have to intentionally come out of my own comfort zone. And God has challenged me with this many times. For 16 years in the city of Boston, I worked as an elementary director in a school that was 97% African-American <coughs> children. And the pain is very real. It is not a level playing field. It takes years. David talked this morning about the time investment that it will take to even begin to look at this chasm, let alone bridge it. And I personally heard in those 16 years the cries of those children. Many had had violent episodes in families <laughs> where they had seen family members shot. They were going to sleep, crying and having nightmares at night because of the gunshots going on in Boston. I worked and served an African-American boss who said to me once in an honest conversation, Charlotte, I am so weary of having to explain myself to white people who really don't want to hear. Those things are the profound dialogues that we must enter into. 
We must, mm -hmm. if we're gonna see change, if we're gonna see the revival and the real move of God that we all yearn for, yes. we are all gonna have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone. I have very strong convictions about the segregated church. I know that comes from my Canadian roots because of growing up in Toronto. And my father pastored an inner city church where there were people from every nation <coughs> just about around the world. I thought that was normal. That was my norm. And I realized how privileged I was because that isn't the norm. But that's what heaven's going to be. That's what the kingdom of God is going, is, is now even, let alone in the future. So I just, I uh, guess what I'm trying to appeal to is that we really, really stretch ourselves and listen and put ourselves in situations where we're the minority, and I'm speaking as a white person, where we're the minority for a change because it's life-changing. And I want to say to my African-American sisters, in a very broken time of my life, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Charlotte, you have known me as your lover, but you have not known me as your warrior. And it was the African-American sisters who taught me how to be a warrior. And I thank you from the depths of my heart. Can we take a question? A question or? Wow, thank you. <laughs> that was, yeah. Um, I want to build on something, Latanya, you asked before about this idea of what did we feel? And I'm sorry, was it Bill that spoke before? Um, you know, what's interesting is uh, I get to work a lot, in a lot of situations with a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of different ethnic, a lot of different socioeconomic but I had a really interesting feeling, um, and so when we talk about privilege, uh, I look back into my ancestry, and I have an interesting journey because my grandfather and my father came from Lithuania to flee Russian occupation because the Russians <laughs> had moved into Lithuania twice. So my family came to the United States as immigrants, struggled in the town that I now live in to make it, and my grandfather grew up, I didn't ever experience my grandfather as seeing things specifically racially. He understood what it was like to run away from something. So when I was raised, I didn't get exposed necessarily to the idea of that I knew racism exists. I, I mean, I grew up in this country, I'm gonna know these things. Yet my family experience was one of, I didn't see it directly as I was raised and neither did my grandfather who didn't, wasn't raised in this country yet I'm white and he's white. So it leads me, that led me to a question because I also went over to Estonia, Latvia on missions work and all I heard about was my family was sent to Gulag. My children were taken from me. And so what I recognized was that racism is different than subjugation and diminishment of the other. And so what I wondered about as a person, because you were asking for what does it make you feel, I, I feel empathy. And I also get a sense of question when we think globally in, Sharish, your, your statement, kingdom. What does it look like to see with the lens of kingdom? Because if you go to Lithuania, I found out later on that the sin of my past, so Grant, uh, Lithuania used to have one of the largest temples north of Israel in Europe. And in World War II, the Jewish population was basically decimated in Lithuania. And so the sin of my past was that my Lithuanian ancestors persecuted your tribe. And so, I'm sorry, I'm choking up. So I guess I have a question, which is race is color, yet it goes beyond that when we start thinking about the way the Dr. King's words, the content of our character, not the color of our skin, resonate deeply with me, but I don't know how to live that out here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think all of us walk in the same, we don't have the same history. We, we have histories in different areas of the world that weren't racially driven. They might have been religiously driven. So that's, that's, that's a question for the panel, but I, 
I don't really even know if, what the answer would be. It's just that's what I felt when I saw it, when yeah. I heard that. So. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, one of the things that uh, is important for us to remember, uh, if we look at the hangout in Ephesians for a little while, um, one of the things that it starts out with is, you know, what is our identity? And what does that bring with us? What is our inheritance as children of God? It goes on to talk about how we need to learn to walk worthy of that and of that calling. And because of that, he has given us, you know, the fivefold ministry to lead us into the building up of the body in the bond of unity in the spirit of the, in the bond of peace. But and he goes on to tell us how to treat each other. But in the, in the sixth chapter, he says, but you're going to have warfare. There's going to be war against that unity. So the enemy uses separation and he uses isolation in order to abuse and to pervert the image of God. That is his ultimate, is to pervert the image of God. And so where we have, um, you know, each one of us has had, you know, through our generations, there have been certain systems that have been set up by the enemy, because at the same time, God has a plan for our lives. The enemy has a plan as well. And so, um, you know, through the, the racism, you know, as you're saying, it's not just racism. It's any kind of division that the enemy can possibly bring, which began as the, 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 uh, the teacher gave us, uh, you know, that the Lucifer, first separated himself from God. And then he came to the earth in the Garden of Eden, separates man from God, separates man from woman. You know, through separation, he's able to go in and break the image that he's, he's trying to break the image that God has given to each one of us. All of us have been made in his image, but he sets up systems so that he can go in and snag us off in, in whatever way we can. So as, you know, so much has been said about, you know, even Rwanda, you were mentioning how, you know, it's not just black and white, but here we have black against black. This young man over here, he talks about how I wake up in the morning and I see myself as a black man. Well, there are people that are darker than him that'll say, well, you're not black enough. You know, there is, you know, we, the enemy will set up systems so that however he can get in through separation and isolation that he will be able to do that. So that's why it's real important for us to elevate our thinking and recognize that, that the gospel, that, you know, who we are in Christ is our playing field that makes us, puts us on an equal plane. We can see things from God's perspective instead of our own. You know, there's the scripture says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the, in the end, it may not be right for everything. It could bring destruction. Um, you know, hanging out in, in the word of God and really wanting to see, okay, this has happened to me, but what is your perspective of it? How, sh how could I see this? You know, my sister over here who, you know, had trouble with white women. There are a whole lot of black women that have problems with white women. But what we don't understand is that a lot of times the enemy will isolate us so that we can't see that maybe... God has a blessing that he wants to take place between the two of us, but the enemy has set up a system that will cause me not to want to reject my sister for some dumb reason when I look back. You know, 2020, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, what is it? Uh, hindsight, okay? Uh, uh, we we kind of poo-poo it, but it's 2020 vision. At that point, you can see you know, what you couldn't see before. So my thing is, if I can see something later, then I could probably could see it now if I just seek the Lord to show me what I need to see about a particular situation. So, and, and to come against those spirits, to do that warfare and say, okay, the enemy uses wiles, which are tricks. You know, how is he trying to trick me? How is he trying to trick that person? Yes, I need to listen to my brother. I need to listen to him empathetically, but with the Holy Spirit to show me what, how do I bring healing to that brother? How, you know, how do I see what 
what the particular stronghold is there, how did his image get broken so that I can help him to then hear from God and come into his place, his identity, his inheritance, so that he can do the same thing. Amen. Amen. Good, Dick, did you want to say something? Yeah, in response to Corey's um, thought, um, I said to Greg, I don't think I belong on the stage because this really doesn't make sense to me. And I said, the reason is because it's not so much about race, it's about ethnic group. And my ethnic group is white, um, and it's French Canadian and Irish. And so when I watched um, the documentaries on black people being persecuted in the South and the eyes on the prize, I cried looking at it. And, but I identified myself as I have come from a persecuted ethnic group as well. So I identified it. I didn't identify myself as white. I identified myself as Irish and as Catholic and as, as French Canadian. So my experience of this is it doesn't seem to make sense. There was one, in my high school of 500 kids, there was one black girl in our whole school, and we loved her. She was wonderful. It was not an issue in our um, upbringing in Manchester, New Hampshire. But was, what was an issue for me is that my, my father was Boston Irish, and when he came here, Irish <laughs> need not apply for a job. They were persecuted. When, um, when my father, Boston Irish, made, married French Canadian, New Hampshire woman, I found the French Canadians were persecuted by the Irish. So the, all the bishops in New Hampshire were all Irish and all the French Canadians were second class citizens in New Hampshire. So I came of it with that kind of experience that my different ethnic groups had, had come as immigrants and had struggled to emerge in, in the times, which I identify with what the ethnic group of black people have struggled with in a similar way. So I don't see myself as having white privilege. But my generation, my parents' generation, worked really hard and overcame, and now Catholics are the most educated and affluent people in the country because we've, a generation later, have emerged. So identifying myself as an ethnic group that's overcome, and one day in heaven there's going to be all these ethnic groups, and my ethnic group is going to be there and all the other ethnic groups and they're they're going to be beautiful it's beautiful that we have black and all different colors it's our ethnic group that God has made and it glorifies him to have all the nations all the tribes there so I see you as greatly valuable and so I'm seeing things differently than the way they've been described here and so in in my situation in New Hampshire this is not the issue uh, the last night of 10 days of prayer, we are at New England Pentecostal House of Praise, and we so look forward to that shouting Pentecostals that we come to on the last night. We have the greatest time. We look forward to it in, in our 10 days of prayer. So we greatly value what they bring to our community. But the issue for me is that I'm Catholic. I'm an evangelical Catholic. And my daughter goes to college, and she said, Dad, she goes to college in the South. She said, Dad, as soon as they found out that I'm Catholic, they start treating me different. I've never experienced this before. So I just want to bring that there's a whole different perspective from ethnic group and socioeconomic. And um, so, you know, it, it makes it complex that I identify with the sufferings of black people. I don't see myself as having white privilege. I see myself as being an ethnic group that has emerged uh, by education and, and thank the Lord for that grace. Great. Could we pass Could that I, down to Kadesh ooh. and let her uh, speak? Thank you. Thank you. I know my husband had something to say first, but I'm going to say something and then pass the mic uh, to him. Um, and I think uh, I just want to uh, recap as best as I can a couple of things that the Holy Spirit was clearly trying to put together um, in the last five comments. So before... Um, Greg, you spoke about um, the lens and seeing through the lens yeah. of an African-American male. Uh, the Holy Spirit gave me a vision about, and it was actually through looking at this audience, not from the context of skin or gender, but uh, vision. Mm. And so different people in here are wearing different glasses, and I can't actually tell based on the glasses that you're wearing what your vision challenge is and what your impairment is. Um, but if you took your glasses off, sir, or you took your glasses off, ma'am, you wouldn't be able to see the panel in the way that you're seeing the panel right now. And I think um, 
what the Holy Spirit is getting at and to everyone's point about identity and the differences and the way God has made us unique for a reason. Um, if he wanted us to all look the same, he would have designed us in that way. So I think there's a purpose in the design. I think the issue with the purpose in the design is that we have reconstructed the purpose of his design for our own edification and our own identities. And if we cannot be real about the principality of racism or gender crises or whatever the principality is, right now the principality we're talking about is racism. There's ethnic challenges as a principality. There's, um, you know, we can name the principalities, right? They're, they're all over. And racism is the one that we're talking about. But I think back to the point and where the Holy Spirit wants us to get is that um, the lens in which we see through um, is a real lens. And my lens is different from your lens. Greg's lens is different. But until the church decides that we want to look through one lens, until we decide as a church what that lens looks like, we cannot realistically then say that we're ever going to defeat this principality. You can look to the word, we'll use the word and the word is the light, but not everyone interprets the word the same. That's the truth. And I think the truth of the word is what will help us, but we always have to keep passing the lens around. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. I have to be able to see the way that you're seeing, and you have to be able right. to see the way that I see. And the things that I experience either impair my vision, like you, you talked about an experience with you that then you, you were not 2020 anymore, you had 1820 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And or we're just gonna have to continue to pass the glasses around and from the lens of Christ, but really being willing to go, like Megan said, to that hard, uncomfortable place. Right. And the truth is, we do not all see this principality the same. We don't. And until we can wrestle with that and talk about that from a real authentic place, separating ourselves from the issue, hmm. then we're gonna be having these roundtable talks for generations, which we have been. And so I think we need to just get honest with yeah. the places that we're looking from. And that's what the Holy Spirit is saying, is what are you looking from? And I saw where you were. I saw you in, in the vehicle. And I was going to talk about vision before you, you said that. <laughs> and so I know that the Holy Spirit revealed that to you because he's asking us to look through one lens. Sure. But what is that? What's that lens look like? If you have 1820 and I have 2020 and you have 510, we have to be realistic about how we get to a space where we are building up our visual capacities for this principality enough so that when I stand without the lens, I'm still seeing the same thing as my husband. Mm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, How's everybody doing? My name is Chris. I didn't get a chance to introduce everybody to myself to everybody yeah, on the panel, so hey, Chris. I went around. I just want to say hello. I'm with the uh, Anti Artichoke Defamation League, so <laughs> I'm gonna need to get your friend's name and address after this. So I'm gonna follow up on that. Um, Where are you guys from, by the way? Uh, we're from Roxbury. Great, thank you. Yeah, in Boston. Um, so I'd first like to thank God for giving me a wife that'll volunteer me to speak. <laughs> so, anyway, um, no. Um, I wanted to follow up on Corey's question for sure, uh, and then also kind of just based upon what Kadesh was saying a little bit earlier, talk about vision. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes it's important to understand for me, as a, as a white male in America, that you have to um, sit with the confusion that the devil tries to bring. You know, like Jesus was in the desert for 40 days and he had one person that he was, two people. He had two people that he was working through to get to who he was supposed to be in the flesh, uh, God made flesh. Um, and he was dealing with the confuser, the, the, the confuser, right, the trickster. Okay. And he was dealing with himself. In, those, in, in his 40 days, right, fasting in the desert, no food, no water. And I think that one of the things that God helps me do is realize that I don't have a very good concept of time, right? 
uh, yet, and I have a limited sense of understanding what, what time is, and that affects how I live in his word. Um, and so whether it's 40 days or whether it's 500 years, um, I think it's really critical for me to try and reach back and understand what's real, not only in my past, as I see it with the lens that I was given um, by the earth and by flesh, but also to reach back and, and, and to identify truth. And so I identify with the context of being Irish Catholic. Both my, my, one of my families is from uh, County Cork and the others from County Clomany. And they arrived at the turn of the century in the, in the, in the 20th century, uh, early 1900s. And I had two grandfathers or great grandfathers with nothing more than a third grade education and spent most of their lives working at the uh, shipyard in, in Quincy. Um, but I also realized too that, you know, when my grandfather, who was 15 or 16, when his father um, was working at the shipyard and eventually took his life because um, he was suffering with mental illness and a whole bunch of other things, I'm sure, um, that even though he was part of a family that had never owned property, that had never had anyone graduate from college, that had never um, advanced in any way that we, I kind of think of right now in American society uh, as, a, as an advancement, um, he, was, he was able to go to war and then come back within a few years and own property 26, 25 miles outside of the city of Boston. And the reason he was able to do that is because of the GI Bill. Um, it's the same GI Bill and the same, and, and also FHA loans from the United States government. Now I know we talk about these things as principalities and you know, things that are not of the, the word, but I also realize that they're connected to the ways in which we are and don't see ourselves because that ability for him to take advantage of the GI Bill and take advantage of the FHA loan also occurred at the same time that generations of families which had worked for nothing or been, been made to suffer and, and work through and, and survive oppression for hundreds of years and came to Boston to make a life, that his advantage happened at the same time that they were blocked into communities by redlining. Because those same loans that allowed him to achieve the freedom of being a property owner and be and seeing himself in the American, certainly Christian, but also American um, ideal also blocked out 99% of African American men who were veterans who applied for the GI Bill to go to, to, to for, for FHA loans and 80% of African American men who applied to go to school off the GI Bill. And two generations later, my family owns property that's valued at $250,000, right, or was able to leverage that property to send me to school to get a college degree. And if you look at the average wealth of white folks who live in Boston and African Americans who live in Boston, Today, right now, the Boston Globe has done a study. The average wealth index for white families is $248,000, the vast majority of which is in home ownership, and it's $8 for African American families. And when I look at that, I'm faced with a reality, right, about my whiteness. And the reality 
doesn't negate the love I have for my grandfather. Mm. It doesn't negate the love I have for my country. It doesn't negate the love I have for his service. What it does is it makes me think about the test that it is required to come to true identity in Christ. And Jesus said, I came to bring the sword. Not in the war sense, but in the interpretive sense, which is the sword is connected to the word to decide. Because the sword cleaves and cuts through the confusion and it divides the truth. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I think that what I want to start to do as a, as a white person for the rest of my life is not apologize for my understanding of where I sit in the process of coming to my identity in Christ, but to cut enough away where I can be real with what, what God expects of me. And that's, that's, no easy, that's no easy day, right? But it, when, I, when, I, when I was able to get to that point, man, it, it's, it's freeing in a real way. It's really freeing because you got nowhere to go but God. There, there's nowhere else to go. And so I want to take on things like this concept of manifest destiny, right, where white men are the, 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 the progenitors of every kind of revival that happens in the course of American theological history and set the bounds for it, right? I mean, we could talk about Martin Luther King and the work, and the work that Dr. King did in, in, in his own ministry, right? But, you know, on the day he died, the vast majority of Americans still largely disagree with what his, his ministry w was, was saying about Christian life. And so I just want to be completely real and, and say that I may not, you know, we're all, we all in some way engage in oppressors, be, uh, occupy the role of oppressors and oppressed in some way, uh, to Corey's question. But I want to see myself for real in the context of where we are. And um, I want to do that with other people, other white people as well, too. Yeah, wow, that's great. Do you want to take a question? Yeah, um, we're going to take another a question. Yes. And then we'd like to also hear from anyone who hasn't shared. Yes. Go ahead, brother. I suppose it is fair to say that um, there's a lot of, well, ethnic factionalism uh, all abroad in the world. And it afflicts our country too, obviously. Um, even, well, see, James Madison uh, in Federalist 10, um, even when this country was sort of remarkably uh, non diverse and um, not, not very multicultural, um, noted the problem, the, the danger of faction. And when it comes to, you know, ethnic factionalism, it does seem that, um, well, you know, folks of one group or another do seem to try to, you know, advance their own group at the uh, relative expense of others. And it doesn't all have to be a government program or anything like that. It, um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, different, you know, seeking different standards and so on um, to be, you know, again, a double standard or being, being not, not sort of evaluated in the same way that others are for, um, for things. In any case, um, it's, well, one of the things I've been kind of, uh, well, when people become easily disappointed in one another, I've noticed, uh, other ethnic groups and such, it's not just the ways in which they speak, you know, slightingly of them, um, but, well, Christina Bennett is a young lady who spoke over here at Hibbard uh, at two o'clock, 
And it was really encouraging that a lot of her background is with um, pro-life advocacy and, and organizing. And, um, you know, that, that goes to, you know, values. Values that people within Christendom share. Even people outside of Christendom who are just ethical and, and who care uh, also share them on that. And that's encouraging when you do find out that people will show up to, uh, you know, and organize and so on for, uh, for a good cause that reflects that kind of thing, that isn't just sort of the advancing of their group kind of thing. Um, there, uh, I'm going to try to well, yeah, we've shorten this up and I'll, 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 I'll make it. Uh, you. Just, e e e can you put yeah. it in a question? It would be wonderful. Th th Thank there you, you go. Um, one of the more encouraging things about five years ago was it in California there was a referendum I think it was a statewide binding referendum on the definition was it the definition of marriage this is by the way the question part because I real, it was a factual question I hope you all can help me on what was the the referendum question where it became clear that the African-American community had voted in favor of the Christian view on a matter of either the definition of family, um, definition of marriage, um, maybe religious freedom. It was probably on the, on the definition of marriage. And, um, well, the, the liberal corporate media was, was shocked and appalled to find that the African-American community did not join them in their agenda. Uh, but I tell you, a lot of folks were greatly encouraged to find that, uh, yeah, the African-American community does largely adhere to uh, Christian values and care about that kind of thing. And given a chance to vote on it, they'll show it. It's kind of cool. In any case, the um, question is, what was that referendum? Even though it was overturned later by, uh, I forgot what the, the Supreme Court case was. Thanks. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the referendum was, but uh, we're probably touching into the arena of why do people vote the way they do and get into the political alignments they do, and what should we truly believe? So um, I think we have to go back to. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to delve into some aspects of maybe what the question was, but. Mm -hmm. I think what we do need to emphasize, uh, and maybe people can comment on this, is instead of, um, it's like someone was saying earlier, like, why do we get caught, you know, talking about, I think it was Charisse, the way the world uh, speaks or how they act or why, why are we getting sucked into their debates or what have you. It's like the church is to be the lighthouse, and I think our brother's question and comment is, when given the opportunity to vote on an isolated issue, the vote was a vote for God's way. Um, and I think what that points out is that the church needs to rise up and not be beholden to any person or politic or anything. Because if we start there and try to make argument, we can often lose out. But if we start here in heaven and we say, what is the salt and light of this matter? That should form everything else that we're about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes God uses different people to lead in different ways. And, but yeah, the temptation is always to make this alignment with earthly things. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes because we feel like we're forced to when you make a vote, right? Mm -hmm. But whenever we make a Whenever we do that, I mean, it always has to be, we have to come from that perspective. We are the church. We are here to be the governmental entity starting from heaven to declare and rule into this salt and light as light, a lighthouse and a beacon into this world around us. So we can't get drawn into the wrong battles and mm -hmm. difficulties. And uh, sometimes voting forces us to do things where it's like a mixed bag. And so it, it's, yeah. 
and we also want to give opportunity for anyone I don't want to I'm just really quick so, I don't want to say anything specifically about the referendum referendum because I have no idea what it is but I, what I do want to speak to is the narrative about uh, black culture as a whole there's this perceived notion because of what we see in the media about black people and I think um, you only see one side you only see one side and what we do sometimes as the church and we're meant to be different, to function differently, and to see differently, is we believe the narrative that we see. Mm. And we have to be intentional to do what we've been talking about on this stage, and that's to formulate relationships and get to know be people on the basis of their character and not what we see on the news and not what we hear. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay. That's a great point. Uh, your name. Thank Lisa. You. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for... I hope to offer a little bit of a different perspective. Um, we all do see loud. through a lens, and that lens is shaped majoritarily on our experience. So I think my experience is a little different, um, born not in the South, but in the deep South of Alabama. Mm. Um, have ministered largely, you know, in very different places in the world, but if we're not careful, we will choose not to grow past the lens of our experience. And we have to grow past immaturity. In 1 Corinthians, when Paul's beginning to speak about the offices in the church and about the gifts, he said, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. Mm -hmm. We are called to educate ourselves to see past the lens of our experience. Mm -hmm. Our lens may be that we have not experienced racism. Maybe we haven't even seen it because that wasn't our experience. But there are very real issues that exist just because we can't see them or we may be ignorant to them because we don't know they're going on does mm -hmm. not excuse us to a place where we can be silent because silence is a sin. Mm -hmm. For the church to be silent against the issues when God has given us the authority to shape culture and to change it. Mm -hmm. There are places in Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi still that my dad as a Jewish man cannot go in and sit down and eat. <clears throat> he will not be waited on. Sure. And they are not apologetic about it. My spiritual mother, I called her. I have um, <coughs> two beautiful daughters that are called into the ministry. If you're a missionary, you raise missionaries. That's just how it happens. So when they say, I'm going, you say, yes, Lord, and you send them. But my 16-year-old had this holy anger about a racist comment she had heard. And so my spiritual mother is black. So is my spiritual father. And she raised me up in the spirit. And this is a powerful woman of God. And I was talking to her about um, Elizabeth's boldness and how I needed to train her, yes, to use um, what people perceive her as white. So to use her voice for something good, but how to do it with honor. And my spiritual mother was crying, and she's 75 years old. And she said, Lisa, I learned to be silent. Powerful woman of God said, I quit fighting and just give up on it. So for us to think because we don't experience it in our town or our state or even our nation, Americans are real good at thinking America has the majority on the whole world, that whatever we see is going on. But we have to be willing to grow past our lens of experience <laughs> and say, what has my sister's experience been? What has my brother's experience been? And not just say, oh, well, I really don't see the issue. Because we do all have to look through the same lens. Mm -hmm. And if we have been given a voice to change that, no matter the cost, it says to count the cost before you go into battle. God has <laughs> called me to racial reconciliation. Guess what? That means I'm in the hard places. Mm -hmm. I refuse refuse to be silent. So sometimes the Lord sends me and I never look like anybody in, in a building. Um, 
and I ask them, why is there only one ethnicity in this church? And I ask them. I, and, I'm, and I ask them, and they look at me, and, and then I usually start crying, and I'm so passionate about this, not just because of my dad, but because I see the enemy's schemes and his tricks. And this revival we're wanting poured out only comes with the fall of this strong man of racism. And yes, there's more than that That one, but that's the one we're talking about Mm -hmm. today. So we have to be willing to grow past the lens of our experience and understand somebody else's experience Mm -hmm. where we can really grow past this. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, thank you for sharing that. And I don't, I don't think Apostle Williams has said anything yet. So because it's five o'clock, oh, I, Willie, would you like to say something? Okay. So would Apostle Williams, would you close us in prayer in a way that you get to share how you feel as well? Praise God. Oh. <laughs> it's not the best that, way. That was a mouthful, is, is he about brother. To close he us saying, is, he, is, is he getting ready to close us out? Yes, he is. I'll be okay. way out here. So before... Yeah, you, before you close... I, I just wanted to say a couple things before he closes out. And, please. Um, so just for defining purposes, so, so I don't know whether or not we all know this, but I just want to say this, and you can research more on your own later, right? So the concept of race is a pretty recent social construct, okay? So... So we, um, so if you don't know that you should know, it's like formed 1800s, categorized, you know, categorizing people, and it's and it's mostly designed in a way by the person who is in the majority, the group in majority, to create a superior and inferior sort of like dynamic. Okay, all right, and so. I want you all to understand that now it's complicated. It's not just like you can say, well, since it's a social construct, then we can just throw it out. Well, well since it's been, it's been sort of um, reinforced, right, um, by people groups, we, we still have to be sensitive to the, um, the categorizations of race, okay, to understand um, how within a social construct we have created society to keep people, and the church has reinforced it, okay? Now, I'm being firm in that because it's important for us to not leave here and not understand that. We, we have to understand that we have been part of the problem. That's why it's an issue, okay? Sure. And we've defined, so I wanted to say that so that we can go out and do more research on it. You can just Google it, you know, race, the definition of race, Right, and you'll 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 get the information on the whole social construct, how it was created, and where it even first started. Okay, but it's current, it's new, and it's not something that you know. And and we have to repent of it, and we'll yeah. do that tonight. And we have to repent of it. Thank you, and that's why Pastor Marion was earlier saying like mm-hmm. racism in the Bible, because it, in a lot of ways it was introduced through slavery. Apostle Marvin, would you share uh, your thoughts uh, in prayer and close <laughs> out? And While she was talking, out. I thought about uh, the wars that went on. And they found out that when the wars were going on and they were fighting the Japanese or whoever it was, they dug foxholes. And when the two men of different colors got in those foxholes <laughs> and had to watch each other's back, they formed a relationship of trust. And what I found out over the years, I've done a lot of things to community-wise where I heard some uh, questions saying, how can we mend together? How can we work together? What we did in Louisiana, we had a wild jam. And this is just an example where All the different churches of different colors came together. We brought food, boxes of food. We painted nails. They cut hair. Everything was free. But as one community in Christ, we worked together in the foxhole. That built relationship between the communities. The churches didn't make no difference what color we work together. And so 
when I'm listening to this, I say this is something that God is after. We, we're hitting a lot of things, but it's more about us coming together as one person. Amen. I embrace, let me tell you this, I embrace all you white brothers and sisters. I love you. I thank God for you. We need you. We need See, that needs to be said. And you need me, whether you know it or not. I know you need me. Amen. And I need you. Thank God for you. And we have to embrace each other like that. The Lord told me a long time ago that you need, I need my wife. I said, well, I don't need nobody. I'm, you know this. And the Lord said, no, you need her. Until you get to that point where I need my brother here. He got something that I don't have. Mm -hmm. God has given him one piece of this thing. And I'm trying to do the whole thing. But I got him. That's what God is after. Mm -hmm. To merge cross-pollinate and you can try to do it in the church but God wants you out in the field to do it first together in the foxhole Amen. where you will learn one another I learned a lot of my white brothers God took me out of a black church put me in a huge white church with three black families and told me they was prejudiced and I'm a fighter anybody know me karate man fighter all that I was all and I said Lord are you crazy you put me out here in these people but the, God told me something. He said, if you will submit yourself and love these people, I'm going to show you how to change them. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The first day, they took an ice pick and stuck my tire to let me know they didn't want me at that church. I'm talking about <laughs> stuck an ice pick in my tire. And the Lord had already told me all this stuff, but see, God challenges us. And he said, just love them. Just love them. Use your gifts and everything I gave you and love on them. That's how you win, folks. But if the thing I found about, we was in Johnson County, one of the richest county. That church was one of the richest churches in the community. You hear what I'm saying? I come from a little black church. And I seen God change their heart. Mm. Just a few people being obedient. Yeah, I suffered. I was talked about. And God said, just cook them some barbecue. It's the <laughs> craziest thing you ever want. What has that got to do with anything? <laughs> God, but the anointing and your gift will make room for you. And I'm saying in this room, I see all this anointing and gifting in here. Mm -hmm. And God said, just bring that together and let, them, let the world see how you get along and love one another. You are the example. How you get along in here. How we get along. How we work out there. That's what they need to see. The love of God. Amen. What leads man to repentance? The love of God. Not you beating them over the head. The love of God. So I just want to share that because I, I just feel that there's something here that God is really going to impact with. Mm. But he has to bring us into that relationship with each other yeah. that's close enough. And what he taught me to do is that I've been learning about covenant. And you my covenant brother. When you accepted Christ, you got the blood of Jesus. I got the blood of Jesus. You my brother. So I look at people like natural family. I got a big family natural family, don't mess with my family. <laughs> That's how I feel. If you're my Christian brother, don't mess with my family. And so we look out for each other. If you're hungry, I'll feed you. You need clothes, I'll get you some clothes. Mm. If, you, if you don't have nowhere to stay, I'm going to work it out. We'll make sure. That's what's supposed to happen. And when people yeah. see your love for one another, it'll change people. It'll change them. And so, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus yes, Lord. that the Holy Spirit Hallelujah. is here to reconcile us back to each other, Lord, first and then to you. We thank you for reconciling us to you for this loving body of your body, the extensions of who you are in this setting, in this, in this auditorium tonight. 
And Father, I ask you, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come in here and change our minds and our hearts that we're sensitive to whatever you tell us to do. Whatever you tell us to do, how tell us how to love, teach us how to love, matter of fact. Teach us how to love one another. For you said love is of God, and he that loveth knoweth God, for God is love. So, Father, let the love of God be shed abroad this place, in this arena, and the peace that surpasses all understanding would keep and guide our heart through Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you from this time forth that there is a coming together on one accord of us and your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Hey, we wanted to thank everybody for coming. Sharice, yes. Pastor Marion and I are conspiring because we want Latanya to sing this song. I know she knows it. <laughs> <laughs> I know she does, so I'm bringing the mic over here. <laughs> yes, you do. Oh, we're going to do this tonight, this song. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> That's a great way of saying, come on never tonight. Mind. At doing six, it tonight. At 6.30, we've got that queued up. Oh, that's never a, mind. That's the conclusion <laughs> of our yes. program tonight.